Hello, everybody. We go to our next presentation, the 130 presentation by Dan Sanderson. Yay, he's right there. Yay. He's <laughs> he's going to be talking about the Mega 65 and all the wonders it has. That's right. So it might be a lengthy presentation. So sit back, relax, and Dan will take over. Thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, yep, my name is Dan Sanderson, uh, and I, this talk is about the Mega 65, as you can see on the screen here. Uh, Mega 65, you might have heard, uh, or you may not have heard, is a recreation of the Commodore 65, uh, which we'll talk about at length. Um, uh, the Commodore 65, uh, you may not have heard of because nobody has one. Uh, the, it is an unreleased successor to the Commodore 64 and Commodore 128. Um, uh, Commodore never got around to making it. They canceled the project uh, uh, before production. Uh, but we do know about the Commodore 65 because uh, they had prototypes made, and some of those prototypes were sold in the open market when Commodore went bankrupt. So uh, it will, we know something about it and uh, are able to recreate it from that. Uh, the important bit that you can actually own a Mega 65. You can uh, go to the website, buy one right now, um, and uh, join the, an active community of developers and enthusiasts. Uh, I was going to title this talk like uh, "What's New with the Mega 65." Like some people want like updates on the project. A lot of people know about the Mega 65 project because it's been. Um, but I think a lot of people knew about the Mega 65 when they launched their website many years ago and then didn't deliver a product for a very long time. Uh, it was under active development that entire time. It just takes that long to make a Mega 65. Uh, but uh, I think a lot of people are just like, wait, where, I heard about this many years ago. What happened to it? Um, uh, but other people just don't know what it is. So I'm just titling this talk, What's Up, Mega 65? Um, and uh, I'll just sort of give an overview about, about what it is. Uh, a little bit more about me. I owned uh, a Mega 65 uh, starting in May 2022. That was when the first batch uh, delivered of the actual uh, units. Um, uh, I, I was in that first batch, and the the, uh, the pre-orders started in like September 2021, and they shipped in May of 2022. I'm the author of the Mega 65 Welcome Guide, which is an online pamphlet. Uh, it was meant to be just a little bit of extra documentation when I noticed that uh, the Mega 65 was still under active development when people got the first units. And there was a bit of a gap between the uh, idealized experience of the Mega 65 uh, and the actual experience of the Mega 65 at the time. So I wanted to write just a little bit of helper onboarding documentation. Uh, this turned out to be pretty popular. People like this little book I wrote, so uh, I've been keeping it up to date. You can uh, still go to it and learn a lot about the Mega 65. It's a great kind of getting started guide for when you first get a Mega 65. I'm also the author of Dan's Mega 65 Digest, a monthly uh, email newsletter um, and podcast. If you want to hear me read it aloud to you, uh, uh, subscribe in your podcast reader. Um, I, I try to have a little bit of fun with the audio version and, and uh, uh, put together, make it kind of a fun little podcast kind of thing. Um, you can get it by email or any feed reader um, and uh, to, to read it. I'm a member of the Mega 65 Steering Committee, uh, which sort of controls the project as it is, can, continues to be developed. I'm currently the lead of the manual and the ROM. We'll talk about what the ROM is uh, in a bit. Uh, 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 those two things go together. I'll, I'll talk about that, that some too. But um, uh, we do have some excellent documentation um, in the manual, and the manual is still getting updates, as is the ROM. I, and various other projects. I have a weblog where I'm I just blog about programming and some other sort of fun things and, uh, uh, that I've done around the Mega 65. So uh, I think for this room we can do a, a quick and pretty easy pop quiz. Um, uh, as you see on the screen, three computers. What is the name of the computer on the left? Just shout it out. Commodore 64. Com <laughs> 64, very good. <laughs> okay, um, what, what year was the Commodore 64 released? 82, very good. Uh, it was released in 1982 uh, with a, uh, a 6510 CPU. You'll hear a lot of names of CPUs in this talk. They are all descendants from the 6502, which I think a lot of us are familiar with. Um, it's an entire family of CPUs uh, uh, with uh, related model numbers. And the, the 6510 was in the Commodore 64. It had a video chip that's uh, very famously the VIC-2 video chip. It had a very famous uh, audio chip called the SID uh, that provided three synthesized voices. Uh, uh, 64 kilobytes of RAM, that's where it gets its name, and has basic two. Um, 
uh, this is all, I think, very familiar to people in this room. Uh, uh, just uh, by show of hands, who here um, uh, owns or has owned a Commodore 64 in their lifetime? <laughs> Most of us. Very good. Okay. Uh, uh, glad to see that. Question number two. What is the name of the computer in the middle? Plus four. <laughs> plus four. I had a couple, couple of alternate names to shout out. Yes, uh, this is the Commodore Plus Four. What uh, year was it released? 84. 84. Very good. Um, uh, uh, another uh, 6502 uh, family CPU, uh, but with a very different uh, video and sound chip, the TED. Um, I'm under the impression this was targeting kind of the lower end of the market. They were trying to reduce the chip count. There's less memory uh, uh, and, and so forth. It's a cute little machine, but it does not run Commodore 64 software. And this is one of the, the earliest lessons, I think, in the uh, uh, Commodore uh, 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 ecosystem. Uh, sorry, your hand was up first. Um, isn't the plus four like? Weren't they trying to go for the business market and it failed uh, terribly? A little bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, it famously had built-in business software um, that was not any good at all and uh, difficult to upgrade. Y yes. I just noticed you got that it's got 16k of RAM. Is that I wrong? I believe that's an error. Okay. It's lower in cousin the Commodore 16 or 16. I think the plus four, the plus four had 64k. Of RAM, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, right. that's great. Yeah, I, 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 uh, I think I missed a detail on that relationship between, the, as you say, the Commodore 16 was kind of a related uh, uh, machine with the Plus Four. Um, uh, thankfully, irrelevant to this talk, but thank you for the correction. Um, uh, uh, the, the, main, the main point here is that it did not run Commodore 64 software. That's the, the 16 right there. Um, uh, um, so yeah, so there was a, a, this idea of a software ecosystem was relatively new and the importance of this in like a mainstream commercial market was still being discovered at the time. Uh, all right, last question, what is the computer on the right? Commodore 128, uh, year it was released? 1985. 1985, very good, you know your stuff. Um, uh, 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 very shortly after the, the Plus 4, uh, the Plus 4 obviously didn't sell very, very well in the U.S. market, if at all, I don't remember the details. Um, uh, but the Commodore 128 could, could be considered a genuine successor to the Commodore 64. Um, it had a compatible CPU, it had a VIC-2 chip, it had a SID chip, it had plenty of RAM, and so it could actually run Commodore 64 software. Um, and in fact, it was basically a Commodore 64 with a bunch of stuff added to it, right? So uh, it, it also had a Z80 CPU and another video chip and all this other stuff so that it could run CPM software, uh, the CPM operating system and related software. Um, uh, but because it had the same uh, uh, video chip and the same audio chip and basically the same CPU, um, it was very compatible with the Commodore 64. It, it could run all of that software. Um, it did have an, an upgraded BASIC and sort of a newer ROM, but it had a copy of the Commodore 64 ROM inside it, so it could actually run in a Commodore 64 mode that was very uh, compatible with existing software. Uh, this is a still from uh, my favorite episode of my favorite television show. Uh, this is uh, the Computer Chronicles. It was a, a public television show in the United States that ran from 1983 to 2002, hosted by Stuart Chaffe and Gary Kildall. Gary Kildall, of course, uh, famous uh, for having written the CPM operating system um, at Digital Research Incorporated, that's his company. Um, uh, this is my favorite episode, not just because it's about the Commodore 64, uh, but because it came out in 1988. Um, it, it, uh, remember what year the Commodore 64 came out? It was 1982. Six years later, they're still talking about the Commodore 64. Um, uh, I absolutely love this. This episode um, covers not just the computer, but the ecosystem and the culture that was built around the machine. Uh, they feature the uh, Diablo Valley Users Group. Um, and they talk to several users who have written their own software as a meaningful way of engaging with the machine. Um, and, and old thing, Stuart Chaffee refers to this as the good old Commodore 64 in this episode. Um, uh, 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 Gary does a great job of summarizing the importance of the software ecosystem and uh, um, uh, how important it's been and how surprisingly la long lasting it's been. Um, at this point in time, uh, he believed there were 7 million uh, sold in the United States alone. Um, our, uh, our best estimates, I understand it, is that overall worldwide, the Commodore 64 sold about 12 million. And that's based on an analysis of serial boards, on, uh, serial numbers on the motherboards. Um, um, at some point in this episode, the uh, 
uh, there's a, a, a broadcaster voice over that de describes the Commodore 64 as a little 8-bit machine that refuses to die. Uh, <laughs> I will point out that the current year is 2023, <laughs> and we are attending the Pacific Commodore Expo <laughs> Northwest. Hey. Um, all right. What is the name of this computer? Mega 65. This is, this is not the Mega 65. This is actually the Commodore 65, um, uh, fully set up and, and running its uh, uh, prototype stuff. Um, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, our, our best understanding of uh, how Commodore uh, tried to put this together, they were uh, teasing the Commodore 65 as early as September in 1989. There is a published interview in uh, uh, Compute's Gazette magazine uh, um, that it mentions the Commodore 65. Um, as far as we know, actual production or actual development work didn't start until late 1990. Uh, uh, we know this from the dates that are on the um, uh, motherboards of the prototypes. Um, it was intended to be one more model in the Commodore line with Commodore 64 compatibility. In fact, it does have a Commodore 64 mode, uh, but but it also has some competitive new features uh, for the time of the early 90s. Uh, so the specs here are a another CPU um, in the 6502 lineage. Um, the 4510 CPU. It actually runs at 3.54 megahertz. Uh, the uh, other uh, previous computers all ran their CPUs at about one megahertz. Um, well, at one megahertz, I shouldn't say about. Um, I had 128K of RAM. It was expandable to eight megabytes in the Commodore 65. Um, it had 128K of ROM, and that includes the Commodore 64 ROM, again, just like the Commodore Word 28 did built in. It had a sequel to the video ch chip, uh, the VIC-2 uh, sequel of the VIC-3. It added some new video features, again, to be sort of competitive in the market at the time. Um, although it's still pretty low end, I mean, the Commodore did have the Amiga uh, already by, by now, and there were some uh, uh, pretty hefty video properties there, but the VIC-3 was meant to be an upgrade. It included two SID audio chips for a total of six voices. It had interesting uh, uh, memory management. Uh, hardware, so you can do some fancy uh, blitter style graphics um, with it and an upgraded basic. You can see here it has a built in three and a half inch floppy drive. Um, it's a, a feature that I, I think would have been really compelling at the time, and by modern standards, I think people say, Why is that there? Um, but uh, uh, it is a 1581 compatible floppy drive. It had uh, the standard Commodore 64 style peripheral ports, including an IEC serial port, joysticks, and stuff like that. Um, very strangely, the Commodore 65, at least what we've seen in the prototypes, had a Commodore Plus 4 style cartridge port, which like, it is a red flag, right? Like, if you're really going for Commodore 64 compatibility, um, why put a Plus 4 style cartridge port in there when, I mean, I don't know how many Plus 4 style cartridges there were, but I'm pretty sure there were more Commodore 64 style cartridges. Um, uh, again, it's, it's a little bit hard to say exactly what Commodore would have done with this machine had they released it to production. We know these uh, uh, from the uh, prototype units, but uh, that's what it had. Um, and there's documentation too, I sh shouldn't say it's uh, completely unknown. Uh, they also planned a, a new model of external 3.5 inch drive with a different connector. It was not an IEC uh, serial connector. Um, uh, so yeah, the, let's talk about this C64 mode a little bit. The uh, 4510 CPU is a descendant of the 6502, but it is not a 6502. The uh, other computers that we saw all had variants of the 6502 that basically were the 6502 with minor electrical changes and things like that, but otherwise supported the exact same instruction set, um, and including undocumented behaviors. This is just something that happens in CPUs and just sort of these electronics is that uh, they say, okay, these are all the ways if you put these numbers in these places, it'll do these things. And, and uh, if you try to put other numbers in there, we won't guarantee anything happens usefully at all. Um, uh, but something will happen if you uh, use these undocumented behaviors. Um, and this is a bit of a trick because when uh, people really started writing Commodore 64 software that it really exploited the platform, they started exploiting those undocumented behaviors. Um, and so, you know, luckily with the Commodore 128, they basically had the same CPU that had support for all those undocumented behaviors as well as the documented ones. So the Commodore 128 got away with a great deal of Commodore 64 compatibility. Uh, not so with the 4510. The 4510 is actually a successor. Um, it's based on the 65CE02, uh, which uh, was uh, had as an ancestor the 65C02, uh, which was descended from the 6502. Each of those models added new features, and to add new features, you get rid of the undo previously undocumented features to make room, right? 
Um, so uh, the new features are great, by the way. I actually really like coding for these uh, CPUs. They've got like the relocatable zero page. They just call it a base page. Uh, there's an extra register and other uh, great things. The 65 CEO2, if I remember correctly, um, was only used for the Commodore 65 and an Amiga CD-ROM drive of some kind and was not used for anything else, uh, which is a little bit silly. But uh, um, uh, yeah, so uh, it, it, the C64 mode works with certain limitations. It'll run some Commodore 64 software, but not all of it. Um, you know, uh, uh, copy protection mechanisms will break and, and other things. So. Um, uh, so it effectively had pretty poor compatibility with this design relative to the Commodore 128. Um, it's not at all clear if this was like the reason why Commodore said this is never going to work, we're not going to make this machine, but it was definitely a design flaw uh, that was uh, going to doom it one way or the other. Uh, so yeah, so it was never for sale. Um, uh, all the photos we've seen are from a single eBay auction uh, for one of these prototypes. Uh, um, the, the, uh, they did release a, um, a bunch of these. Uh, they abandoned the project in 1991. Uh, and uh, it's really important to emphasize that these prototypes were unfinished. Uh, the, the state of the software had like missing features and lots of bugs, and uh, it wasn't entirely clear how it was going to be uh, fixed up. Uh, I think the DMA chip doesn't, didn't work quite right. I forget, or it was missing some features, I, I believe. Um, uh, in 1994, when Commodore went bankrupt, they liquidated their, their supply, and there were a couple of companies in the United States, uh, including the, the Grapevine Group here, that picked up those prototypes and tried to sell them. Um, they said, oh, it's a new computer! It's a new <laughs> Commodore 64! Everybody get excited! Uh, buy one of these for 104 pounds. Um, uh, this is an ad from Amiga Shopper in uh, 1994. Um, the uh, uh, estimates, as always, of uh, how many Commodore 64 prototypes there were varies widely. The one web page I've been using for most of my resources says that was as many as 2,000 prototypes made it out. Um, uh, but these were in varying forms of completeness. There were six different revisions of the motherboard in these prototypes, so they were all a little bit different from each other. Um, it's hard to really say what was the Commodore 65 in that sense, because it was unfinished and there were different versions of it and so on and so forth. Uh, those photos from that eBay auction, uh, that eBay auction supposedly sold that uh, prototype for $30,000. Uh, this is Dr. Paul Gardner Stephen, uh, shown here trying to make a phone call. Uh, uh, Paul had a Commodore 65 prototype. He got, got a hold of one at some point, um, and he used it for many years. It was like his favorite thing for, um, I, I just going from the calendar dates, uh, um, he must have had it for at least 10 years, if not longer. Um, in uh, 2010, he had to get rid of it. For the usual reasons, I think many of us here have had the experience of uh, having owned our childhood computers and then at some point decided we can't afford to keep them around, we don't have the space, we have to get rid of them. Um, which uh, reminds me, if anyone here picked up a carload of Commodore 64C or Amiga stuff from a brick apartment building in the University District around 1999, please see me after. <laughs> I would like my data disks back. Um, <laughs> It's a long shot, but this is the right room for it. I don't, I don't know. Uh, 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 anyway, so so Paul decided at, uh, he got rid of his in around uh, tw uh, 2010, um, and uh, he decided he missed it uh, as he would. But he, he missed his Commodore 65, uh, so he did what any of us would do. He created a new one from scratch with his bare hands. <laughs> uh, he started work on the uh, what he called the C65 GS GS Stephen in uh, 2014. He actually started a developer blog, which is a really cool set of articles to go back and see the history of this project. He's, he wrote uh, quite a few articles um, uh, what, during development. Um, and then the next year he partnered with a, a German nonprofit, uh, the Museum of Electronic Games and Art, uh, which is a, a, a nonprofit committed to projects like this, sort of uh, both historical um, uh, preservation and recreation of the uh, experience of these things. And in 2015 they founded the Mega 65. So yeah. Uh, the Mega 65 exists. Uh, you can get one. I have one right here. There's another one right there. Um, uh, so it is a recreation of the Commodore 65, but I think I want to ask the question again, what is a Commodore 65 if it was an unfinished product, if nobody had it, right? We, we know what a Commodore 64 is because millions of people had them. And there was a very common idea of what a Commodore 64 was, all the way down to the specifics of the way the machine worked and what software ran. 
Um, we have no such definition for the Commodore 65 other than a, a handful of prototypes. Um, so really, like, it, to say that this is a recreation project is a little bit tricky, because really what it's doing is finishing what Commodore started. Uh, we want this machine to not just be a replica of a broken prototype, but we want it to be a, a fun and useful machine for everyone to use. Um, so, uh, you know, finishing the design, uh, ad ad adopting the software, and fixing it, and improving it, and adding modern conveniences and things like that are, are very much an important part um, of the mission of the project. But again, what did Commodore start? That's actually kind of a, a vague question that we need to answer as we're trying to come up with the finished version of this. Um, I, I don't want to exaggerate or be pedantic. I think it's pretty clear in many cases exactly what they were trying to do. Um, and you can just sort of follow the existing lines and finish the thing um, uh, along those lines. We do use um, uh, historical recreation as a guideline for this project to say, okay, well, what we're trying to do is capture um, the Commodore experience. And we can, the best way to do that is to hew pretty closely to uh, uh, some kind of historical recreation. Um, Mega 65 is as open source as it possibly can be. Um, all of the, the physical hardware designs, all of the uh, software as much as possible is open source. You can download it. In theory, you can make your own from scratch if you just uh, borrow these designs and hire your own plastic company and um, uh, uh, source some of these parts and stuff. Um, uh, open source is a little bit tricky here, but like well, one of the things we can do here um, is that it is based on an FPGA, Field Programmable Gate Array. I think some of us are familiar with, with that term. Uh, it's basically an electronically programmable set of electronics. It's a way of making a chip that you can turn into other chips. Um, there, there's sort of a, I don't know, audiophile sommelier argument about whether an FPGA recreation of a, a computer is the same as the actual thing. Um, uh, but I'm not interested in that argument, especially here, because this project just would not exist without a computer. There's just no way that you could make this from original chips, because there were no original chips, right? There, you just can't source any of these things. Um, but moreover, this is a huge advantage for the project because uh, by being kind of a, a sort of firmware, like it's a, like a soft, software that are, that's describing the hardware, it means that anybody can update to a new version of the hardware uh, that includes all the CPUs and video chips and all this other stuff. So we can uh, open source the designs for those chips, people can work on them, contribute to them, and when the time comes, everybody who owns a Mega 65 can upgrade the hardware layer of their machine. Um, so the, the machine does have certain modern uh, conveniences. Uh, uh, we'll review some of them. It's got uh, appropriate video outputs for modern displays and things like that. Um, uh, th that's a major feature of it too because we want people to be able to use these things um, in a wide variety of, of uh, settings and, and stuff and not have to struggle with, oh, what kind of monitor do I plug this into? It does run the original Commodore 65 ROM, uh, which uh, as I said is broken. Um, uh, uh, so we're fixing it. Um, what we actually licensed was access to the source code um, as well as the original binary uh, so that we can um, upgrade it and we have permission to distribute the upgraded version and all of our patches and stuff like that um, uh, uh, to the operating system effectively. Uh, we've made some uh, major fixes and extensions to it. Yes? Is that through Cloanto? It is. That? Yeah. Um, I, yeah, that, that, that's the best, best way to describe it. So Cloanto has uh, um, the uh, licensing rights for the ROM. Um, uh, we also got some uh, distribution rights for GEOS. We can talk about that a little bit too. I actually don't know that much about it, but uh, um, uh, the, the, there is a Mega 65 version of GEOS. Um, so the Mega 65 <laughs> um, has a CPU uh, that uh, uh, we just call the 45 gs 2 I'll let you guess what the GS stands for. Um, it's, uh, again, based on the 4510 or the 65 CEO2 uh, with some additional extensions. So even this has been extended a little bit for the Mega 65, um, mainly to um, make it easier to write assembly language machine code programs uh, to access larger amounts of memory. It's an 8-bit processor like any other, but if you've got, you know, giant amounts of memory, if you want, you know, 32 bits of address space, uh, you need to, uh, special ways of managing 32-bit addresses in an 8-bit processor. Um, it is multi-speed, it can run on the Commodore 64 as a 1 megahertz, or the Commodore 65 3.54 megahertz. Its default speed is 40 megahertz, a whopping speed uh, uh, for this. And I have to say, Commodore Basic 
at 40 megahertz is a game changer. Uh, the, the, this, if you've pro programmed in BASIC uh, on these other computers, you're always kind of bumping up against speed and trying to figure out how to do this stuff. Um, uh, 40 megahertz just makes everything so much easier. Uh, you can run BASIC code that completes before the end of drawing a single frame, uh, which means you can do frame syncing, vertical syncing, um, uh, and uh, have like actual uh, arcade games written in BASIC that run at a steady frame rate. Um, it's, it's spectacular. Um, we also have uh, an updated, uh, so, uh, I'm sorry, the RAM, uh, we'll do the RAM real quick. Um, the uh, Commodore 65 was meant to be expandable, so this is sort of expanded by default to 384 kilobytes. Um, uh, but then there's also a separate bank of 8 megabytes of RAM uh, to use for other purposes. It makes it great for tool building and stuff like that if you need to stash like a large amount um, of uh, data uh, to do things. The uh, video chip is now the VIC-4. It is a new extended sequel of the VIC-3. Um, a lot of the uh, designs for the VIC-4 features, it's like especially for color, um, lots of uh, new color modes and new drawing modes and, and compositing and things like that, um, uh, based largely on era-appropriate arcade-style graphics. Uh, so we're not like adding the most modern graphics card things into this. It's still pretty vintage, uh, but it has lots of uh, new features that are, um, make it really fun and easy to use uh, for, for building games especially. Uh, it, instead of two SID chips, it has four SID chips. It's so a FPGA, why not? Just as many as you like. Um, uh, it, but in addition to the, to the SID chips, it also has a digital to analog converter, which means it can do high quality sound samples. Uh, you can do uh, all kinds of sound samples. I was just uh, on this, uh, on Robert's Mega 65 just now, I was doing a mod player, an Amiga, Amiga style mod player that's playing sound samples for its instruments. Um, uh, it also has uh, more, more extended uh, the memory uh, management stuff. The DMA features uh, have been expanded to do things like uh, common techniques to use the DMA for fast drawing of graphics and things like that, uh, to do paint um, uh, graphics data into memory really quickly. Um, it's also really easy to program for. I've never seen a DMA this easy. It's basically like, oh, it's like a single CPU instruction to copy a megabyte of data from one part of the memory to the other. It, and, and it just, you know, bing, it's right there. It's like implemented in the, the CPU effectively. Um, uh, Basic 65, so yeah, we, we have the ROM. We are finishing the ROM and extending it. Commodore 65 ran Basic 10. Uh, which again, not really released, so it doesn't matter what it was called. But uh, we keep, uh, uh, we have added a few extra things, uh, uh, conveniences to access the new hardware, <coughs> just some nicer sort of usability features to it. So we're calling it Basic 65. Um, still has that built-in three and a half inch floppy drive. Um, the recreation plastic case is actually made from scans of the prototypes or laser 3D scans of the prototype case so that we could design the uh, injection molded plastic case. It's very authentic. Um, the key switches are modern mechanical key switches, so it's really fun to type on. I was talking with a couple of you earlier about how I, I still sort of stumble on the uh, typing speed because of the uh, keyboard buffer of the ROM. It's still the Commodore 64 style keyboard cover. Um, that's a problem I'd like to see us address in a future revision. I, I keep mentioning it. Say, so how do we fix this? I don't know enough about how this works to fix it myself, so let's try fixing it. I'd like to, I would love to type 100 words per minute on this thing, but you can't really do that yet. But it is otherwise a joy to type on. Both HDMI and VGA out, you can sort of see the ports up here in the image. Um, uh, and this is uh, simultaneous. I'm actually right now feeding the VGA to this monitor and the HDMI to my laptop, so we can do a live demo. Um, and that, that can be pretty useful. Um, stereo audio out. It has an audio mixer built in, so all of these different audio sources, you can actually change the mixing of all the different sound chips, whether they're mixed left or right in the stereo field. Uh, a modern DC power supply, uh, which is super useful. No proprietary connector, really simple modern uh, specifications for power. You can, anything that, you know, any common power connector that meets the right specs, you can use with it. Actually comes with a pretty nice one, but uh, uh, it's a, a, a standard piece of power. Um, the, and the usual 9 pin peripheral ports. You can use all the same joysticks and mice uh, with it. Um, in addition to the floppy drive, though, we also have SD card slots, so you can take all the disk images in the world and put them on a single SD card and have them available to the Mega 65. It has a virtual 1581 drive for this purpose, so you can take D81 disk images and treat them as if they're drives. It also has the uh, IEC serial port, so you can connect actual vintage physical drives uh, as well. 
and we've decided um, uh, um, to go against the uh, Commodore 65 design and use a Commodore 64 style <laughs> cartridge port. Uh, we just figured this is going to be more useful to people when they're running Commodore 64 software or even making modern Mega 65 cartridges using the same boards and plastic that we do for uh, making modern Commodore 64 cartridges. And it has an Ethernet port um, for uh, mostly future use, but we already have some uh, uh, demonstrations of uh, accessing the Internet with this thing. Um, writing a TCP IP stack for a vintage computer is a challenge, uh, so it's, it's not entirely there yet, but uh, there, there's some potential there. One of my favorite features is that it actually uses the physical drive to make a gronking noise when you're using the virtual drive. So if you access the, uh, a D81 disk image, it'll, it'll just actuate the physical drive you go, ee, ee, on your uh, 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 loading software. So the Mega 65 is not really about just recreating what Commodore made. It's recreating the experience of having a Commodore computer. In fact, the, the experience of getting a new Commodore computer Figuring out what is this, what does it do? It, the, the unfamiliarity of the thing is part of the experience, and it has like some new features to explore, uh, you know, new basic commands, new uh, assembly language capabilities, uh, new software that can be written for it, new video features, all this other stuff. Uh, uh, Paul calls this the Christmas morning experience. It's like the recreation of the experience of getting the new computer and just wondering what in the world can it do. So historical preservation is a goal, but it, it is secondary because uh, it is largely about this experience. And uh, uh, the Commodore 65 compatibility is does come up as a secondary goal, but it's hard to know what that means. There's not a lot of software for the Commodore 65. Um, it's mostly just like, yeah, let's try to stay as close to a Commodore 65 as is practical uh, uh, to, to preserve that experience of owning a Commodore. Sort of an alternate timeline, I guess, of the 1990s, like what would have happened if Commodore made one of these things. This is the actual box it comes in, by the way. Um, so, so it's a very vintage uh, uh, a new, new uh, thing. It comes with the computer, the power supply, and a printed user's guide. Um, Trends Electronic was our uh, manufacturing part, is our manufacturing and distribution partner for the machine. They're a professional company that do FPGA uh, style electronics um, uh, for lots of different things, uh, uh, located in Germany. Uh, the Mega 65 project was founded in 2015 and in 2019 uh, they solicited donations for the uh, plastic case molds. Injection molded plastic, very expensive, upfront costs. They just raised those through donations. In June of 2020, they um, opened pre-orders for a developer kit, which actually did not use this plastic case. It used a, a transparent acrylic case uh, that's pretty neat. They only made 100 of them. They just wanted to get some of them out there so that people could help uh, sort of beta test the thing, write some software, give feedback on the product. Uh, those uh, dev kits shipped in November of 2020. In 2021, uh, pre-orders opened for the Mega 65 proper. That's when I ordered mine. And in May of 2022, the first batch shipped. We got 400 units shipped uh, in uh, early 2022. Um, that is actually a, a bit of a surprising gap between the pre-order date and the actual ship date. Um, I don't know if you know this, but we were undergoing a global catastrophe at the time uh, that was slowing down the purchasing and assembling and shipping of things. Um, uh, strangely enough, it was, uh, when it came down to it, they had already acquired all the really difficult to get parts for the first 400 machines. What slowed it down all the way to May is the uh, lack of access to cardboard uh, for the boxes that they shipped in. <laughs> uh, so that was like the final delay, and it was very frustrating. January of this year, they shipped another 400. Um, they kind of have to do this in batches just because of the way uh, uh, getting those FPGA chips works uh, in the industry right now, in this moment. Um, uh, uh, so as of right now, there are 900, if you include the dev kits, 900 Mega 65s in the wild. Uh, Next batch is scheduled for later this year. Uh, an unknown number of units. We actually uh, do not get access to uh, certain numbers that would be interesting to know from Trans Electronic. My understanding is this has to do with German privacy laws um, that uh, Trans can't actually share with us pre-order information and some other stuff. Um, it's fine, but uh, um, we will know at some point um, later this year how many will actually ship. Um, uh, I believe we think that all existing pre-orders up to a certain point uh, will get fulfilled uh, by the end of this year. If you place a pre-order now, um, it won't ship until next year. But, uh, 
uh, the, the, it should be a nice, healthy batch and get lots of people the machines they've been waiting a long time. So let's try the live demo, which is guaranteed to go well because that's what live demos do. <laughs> um, yeah, this is the, what you uh, see at first. This is the uh, uh, Basic 65 ready prompt. I have the latest version of the ROM installed. Uh, you can see it, it's got a, a built-in clock. Uh, I don't know if it's set correctly. Oh, it is. Um, uh, you can see I, I, I turned it on at 11.56 p.m., but the current time is uh, uh, 104. Okay, that is, that is wrong. I did not set that for daylight settings. Um, I probably shouldn't have started with that as the demo. But um, you, you can write basic programs here. It's the usual stuff. Um, uh, yeah. Convert basic, very, very familiar. Uh, if I want to uh, mount a D81 disk image, there's sort of a, a meta operating system uh, that's in play here. I hold down the restore key for a second and let go, and you get what's effectively a freezer cartridge. If you've ever used a freezer cartridge on a Commodore 64, it took the entire state of the machine and froze it, and then started running this new program that lets you manage a bunch of things, including freeze states. So I could have multiple freeze states that store on the SD card and uh, uh, switch between them if I want to. Uh, but the most frequent use of this, there are obviously lots of utilities here, uh, but I'll just mount a disk image. Uh, this is my SD card here. I'll scroll down to one of these. And uh, now that's mounted in uh, drive 8, the virtual drive. And so I can resume the machine. And it's back where I left it, but now if I do a directory listing, so sir, I, I think this is a Commodore 128 thing, that you can do a directory listing without populating the basic uh, 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 system. Um, uh, so you can see this is the content of that virtual disk. Uh, I can do a, a, a simple run star, um, and it will load and run it. This is a, a game called Showdown by Badger Punch Games. It's a, it's a new game written for the Mega 65, a little uh, uh, arcade game, one and two players. That's very, very neat. I can try to turn up the audio. Can you get the idea. Um, and I can use a little gamepad to play it and stuff like that. Uh, there's a reset button on the side, super useful. I'll just do that and get back to here. Um, I don't know what else would be worth showing off if anyone sees something that particularly catches their eye. Let me know. But uh, what does what does four SID chip sound like? What does four SID chip sound like? <laughs> Any demo with that? There is one demo with that. I wonder if I have it installed. Where is it? Oh, is it not on here? Someone has done uh, one demo so far that uses okay. all four wow. SID chips. Uh, go, go look for it. It's the Xanadu demo. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll see if I can find that um, at some point and play it and has later. a soft mixer. Oh, there it is. Let's see, oh, wow. um, uh, let's see here. Turn it down. I don't know how long this takes to load, but we can try it. This is actually two different demos um, uh, made for a single demo party, one written in assembly and one written in basic 65. They're both excellent. Um, I won't play the whole thing here. Okay. <laughs> so, that's nice. All right. It's a fun demo. There's a lot going on. Yeah, that's a lot of sits. It's a lot of sits, yeah, and it drives them really hard, too. You can tell it's like really arpeggiating like all of them. Oh, wow. Anyway. Huh. Um, that's on YouTube, too, if you just want to go okay. listen to that song. Um, yeah, let's, just, let's keep going. Yep. Some more to get through. So yeah, so the, you saw this is a, uh, there's an 80 column text display here. Um, uh, it's a 32 entry color palette. And each entry in the color palette can be a possible 4,096 colors. Uh, so it's an adjustable palette. It's not just the, the uh, built-in palette. Um, so yeah, um, it's the usual thing. This is a, a, a basic ready prompt. So you can do immediate mode command interactions for launching programs. You can write programs from it. Uh, using the basic 65 language, this is the freezer. Um, other things worth pointing out here is like, like you can swap your joystick. So if you have a game that needs a joystick in port one, but your joystick's in port two, you don't have to move it around. You can just do the swap. Yeah. Um, what does the sprite editor look like on the like right there? Mm -hmm. Is it different from the Commodore 64? Um, I can go back to the thing and see if I can do it. 
Um, I, I think some of the built-in utilities are, are not fully fleshed out, but uh, um, that's not too bad. Let's see, does this mouse work? So I, I can use a mouse and mess around with it and stuff like that. Um, the, the idea, there's actually some really good sprite management commands in Basic 65, and I think they're inherited from um, Basic 10 or Basic 7. Um, and so it's really easy to sort of just save the sprites that you edit from here and onto disk and then load them into your programs. And then kind you of like the C128, like the hidden like sprite thing where you can just draw it and then put it in. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. Um, although this is happening at the... Uh, uh, the freezer level, so I'm, it probably works a little bit differently. But yeah. Um, let me see. Uh, yeah. So we saw a Showdown uh, uh, as an example. Uh, this is a title screen of another one, a game called Hibernated One. Um, it's actually a text adventure game by Steve, uh, Stefan Vogt. Uh, this is the text adventure game. Mega 65, I love the Mega 65 as a text adventure gaming machine. <laughs> and there's something about the, like, the full screen, 80 columns, that is really appealing for text adventures. The uh, uh, venerable uh, Z-Machine uh, adventure game player, Osmu, uh, which is uh, written for the Commodore 64, uh, also has a version for the Mega 65. It is excellent. It can play all the Infocom titles. You can do all the text adventure gaming you want on this. Hundreds of Z-Machine games by modern authors. Uh, I can say, I can go on and on about that, um, talk about how to write such things and using the informed language, uh, but that's not what the topic of this talk. Um, both Hibernated 1 and Showdown were uh, released as, uh, um, as a, a physical titles. So these are, there's physical title software for the Mega 65 that you can buy with discs and feelies and everything mm. uh, in the boxes. Uh, they're published by Polyplay, which does a lot of great uh, retro gaming titles or uh, new, new gaming titles. Uh, I wanted to include this one. This is a, a, a work in progress uh, by game developer Colin Reed. Uh, the game's called First Shot. It's a side scroller. It's uh, really fun to play. You should come by and try it um, on the machine. So you kind of saw how this works. The, 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 you directory listings and things like that. Um, this is a short program uh, that uses a couple of the newer features. Uh, for uh, uh, you can actually load IFF uh, image files onto the uh, graphics screen. It's got a pretty good bitmap graphics mode. That was actually came from the Commodore 65. And this is a picture of my cat. Wow. <laughs> um, qu uh, quite a few games have been written. Uh, these people keep generating software as they we get more and more people to own these things. They they can't help but write games for them. So quite a few games you can download and play. Uh, there are demos, people are doing demos in, in, in various uh, uh, forms so just to try out the machine and really push on the graphics and sound capabilities. I mentioned I, I really think it's a good tools machine because of its uh, various uh, text modes and things like that. Uh, these are all sort of programming tools that people have written. Uh, the upper left hand corner is a language called Eleven, which is actually just basic with a few extra features. It compiles down to basic 65, which I mm. think is just incredibly clever. Wow. Because if you don't like the old fashioned line editor or the sort of the clunkiness of that, this gives you like a full text editor and some nice structured language features, but it's still basic. It's, it's still just using basic. Um, uh, there's a, we have an assembler, an on-device on assembler called Mega Assembler. That's the upper right-hand corner there. Also has a built-in editor. That assembler is written in BASIC, which I find amazing. Um, uh, the, the one on the lower left is called Copy Break. Uh, which is somebody wanted a more structured assembly language, so they kind of invented their own language just for, for their own use. Um, also has a kind of built-in IDE. Um, it's really cool. It's worth trying. There's a character editor right there that somebody built. Um, I'm not a particularly good Geos person, so I don't know a whole lot about it. That's why I don't have really good screenshots of it. These are actual screenshots of the Mega 65 version. Um, we did get licenses for a continued development and distribution of Geos uh, uh, for the Mega 65. It is a work in progress. I think there are a couple of shortcomings, but it can run most of the major uh, uh, Geos programs. Um, I don't know a whole lot about it yet. I need to learn more about it. The Mega 65, oh yeah, go ahead. Quick question on the Geos thing, can you print? Huh. <laughs> I would have to try it. I mean, the uh, um, uh, it has the IEC port. Right. Um, I think it's got a virtual printer, oh. so the print will fly out. The the, the GS will. I think, I think it does. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, but the Mega sixty five doesn't have that yeah. as a built in feature. Uh, that would be cool. I'd like sort of the ultimate uh, fifteen forty one cartridge. 
as a uh, that 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 would be really cool if it could do sort of virtual printing. Um, um, I guess I, I have a little bit of doubts uh, to the answer to that question because in my experience, the Mega 65 ROM support of the IEC port is a bit limited. It's a bit finicky. Um, it, it has entirely to do with serial timing um, uh, and that faster CPU. We haven't like yeah. fixed mm -hmm. the ROM to really take to figure that out. Yeah. Um, so that's like that's a to-do item on the ROM. Um, I have used um, a printer from. I used a daisy wheel printer from Commodore 64 yeah. mode, and it worked great. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, so there's yeah. uh, there's some potential there. Daisy wheel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. that's uh, awesome. that's what I like. Um, I, I don't like I, I don't really enjoy collecting printers. They're a little bit hard to in, enjoy. But, uh, go ahead. I was I was exploring the I've seen the Fujinet, the Fujinet printers. I thought they were starting to branch out into more of the Okay. That would be very exciting, yeah, yeah. To, to use a FujiNet for, for, for the Mega 65 or just Commodores in general. And, uh, I'd love to see that. Uh, so it, it comes with an SD card built in. There's actually two SD card slots, one inside, one outside. It only can use one at a time. That's kind of weird. But uh, the idea is that if it's the internal uh, SD card, it's like a hard drive, sort of a virtual hard drive uh, for the thing. Um, and we bundle it with a whole bunch of software. So this is a screenshot of a, um, uh, a menu that pops up when you first get your Mega 65 uh, that gives you access to all these demos and, and other things. This is the second sort of intro demo disc um, uh, that, that may come with a future version. Um, so it's like all ready to go, lots of fun stuff to play with. All the usual peripherals work. Um, it, it'll use you know, joysticks, game pads, uh, anything that normally works with a Commodore. Um, it actually does support both the Commodore 1351 mouse and the Amiga mouse. The hardware and, and meta operating system will do that translation for you. Um, so you can just use it in the Amiga mouse if you want. Um, works fantastic with the Mouster, modern USB mm. mouse adapter, that's mm. shown there. I use it with a wireless mouse, it's flawless. Um, there have been some uh, custom peripherals and things you can buy. Uh, uh, there's now a four-player joystick ad mm. adapter that plugs into the cartridge port. Uh, just adds a couple more joystick ports. And there are uh, some pretty entertaining four-player games uh, that you can play. Uh, so that, that's easy to get. There, this is a, an embroidered uh, dust cover. Uh, that, that you can buy uh, from a company called So Ready, S E W. The documentation uh, is excellent, uh, all things considered. It, I, I say it's, I think it's, it's one of the strong suits of the platform that it, they've uh, done a really good job documenting. Mostly Paul, but like the other major contributors, um, uh, have documented their work pretty extensively. Uh, they've tried to uh, keep it in the sort of publishable formats, a giant LaTeX document. Um, the uh, user's guide, um, this is the user's guide that, that comes with the thing um, is, is part of that effort, but this is just a fraction of the documentation available. There's actually over 1,400 pages of uh, documentation, pages of this size that, um, that, that you can access. Um, it's still a huge work in progress, though. These are not really complete books yet. They're more like piles of information. Um, uh, it's, it's getting there, and I, I'm taking it as a major initiative uh, this year to work more on the manuals to get them more into a, a publishable state so we can do a professional print run, um, which is very much the goal. We want to be able to print like a set of books that describes all this new hardware and all the, the, the features. Uh, it's you know, potentially like going to be some of the best computer documentation available, <laughs> uh, um, uh, given how thorough it is. Uh, you can get the PDFs online today. Uh, you obviously download it, use it. People use it for, for lots of different things. Just expect that it's like a giant pile of chapters right now. And, not really edited into a book yet. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't also mention my welcome guide as part of this conversation um, because I do think it uh, provides uh, some value here. It's, it sort of goes beyond the user's guide. Um, I mentioned it sort of describes the gap between the actual user experience and the intended user experience. Um, I think these uh, books that we're writing, the user's guide and stuff, inevitably you want that to describe the intended user experience. And so the, the gap of like, okay, well this doesn't work part, quite yet. You don't want that written in your printed manual. Um, and so the welcome guide kind of uh, um, makes up the difference there uh, and supplements the documentation. Um, I'll mention my digest again because I like promoting it. Um, uh, this is, it's a monthly e email newsletter with a read aloud podcast. Um, the uh, logo is designed by Eric Hill of Amiga Love. He'll be here tomorrow, I think. Um, uh, he also is the one that talked me into doing the podcast version, so you can thank him for that. Um, and this is where you can find it on Substack. Uh, you can also find it on my website if you don't like Substack, and there are reasons to not like Substack, but um, uh, I, I publish it on my website also. If you want to try it before you buy it, 
there is an emulator. Um, it's a free emulator for Windows, Mac, and Linux called XEMU. Um, it does require getting that ROM file. We, again, it's sort of closed source, proprietary, licensed, whatever, so we can't distribute it for free. There's a multi-step process in getting the ROM put together for use in the emulator, but it's free. Uh, you actually, it's a process that involves downloading the original prototype ROM from Cloanto directly. What's it called? XEMU, X-E-M-U, yeah. Um, you can just a Mega 65 emulator in Google would probably find it. Um, yeah, sorry, it's a little tiny there. Um, uh, uh, but what you can do is you can take the original prototype ROM and then we have a patch that is just a binary patch on top of it that generates the final Mega 65 ROM. Uh, we distribute those. It, this is all documented. You can find uh, the instructions online for how to set that up. It's not too bad. Yeah. I have a question. Um, uh, so CBM Basic was written by Microsoft, or, is that right? In the original 64? Something like that. And then but version 7 and the 128 was in-house. Yeah, I, I, my understanding is that a lot of the editions were in-house, yeah. So, so I, I was just wondering with the copyright 1977 Microsoft, what's Microsoft in, in the Mega 65? Uh, so yeah, I, 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 I think that really has to do with the origins of BASIC. Like That's that it. It's just sort of an obligation to, 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 to Yeah. All right. Um, it doesn't say, fuck you, Bill Gates. In the, well, I, I don't think so. Oh, I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> All right. We can, we can try it later. <laughs> um, uh, the emulator is really good, actually, and a lot of people use it um, while waiting for their free order to ship. Like, this is just their Mega 65. Um, and some people just don't buy a Mega 65. They just use this instead. Hmm. People have used the emulator to write substantial software for the Mega 65 without actually having one. It's pretty regular occurrence for somebody to say, hey, I've wrote this amazing thing. Can anyone please try it on a Mega 65? Um, and uh, uh, it, it works pretty well. I'll try to speed through this, but the, uh, there are some uh, pretty good cross-development tools. Um, uh, I'll point out that uh, a couple of these are used for uh, basic programming. Uh, by cross-development, I mean you use your modern computer to write a program and then transfer it to your Mega 65. Um, you can do this with basic. Basic 65 is actually supported by uh, tools like Petcat and CBM Perk Studio. Uh, they, they know about the Mega 65's uh, editions and all this other stuff. They're fully updated for that. Petcat comes with Vice, so if you have Vice, the Vice emulator installed, uh, you probably have Petcat. Uh, if you want the latest version of Petcat, I have some published instructions you can get. Uh, the uh, CPU has new instructions and stuff. I mentioned this. We have some extensions there. So a lot of these assemblers don't really know about those, uh, like DASM and CA65. These are 6502 assemblers. You can use them to write Mega 65 software. They just won't take advantage of the whole machine. But uh, a couple of these will uh, do know about the 45 GSO2. Acme, I like the Acme assembler for that. It's, it's uh, fully up to date with the Mega 65. Um, Kick assembler, the main version, does not uh, know about the Mega 65, but there is a fork uh, you can go find and download that knows about 45 GSO2 instructions. Uh, compiler is a little trickier because uh, compilers not only have to know about those features, but know how to use them when compiling code. So that it's a little bit of a mixed bag. But you can still use uh, these for any Commodore, uh, also work for the Mega 65, with a, c a couple of tweaks. Uh, once you have written your program, uh, one of the things you can do is you can just take the SD card out of the Mega 65, put it in your PC, copy your developed program onto it, and then move the SD card back, and then it will run on your Mega 65. When you're actually programming, that's a little bit slow. Uh, you want a faster feedback loop for that. So uh, there are uh, faster ways of just like connecting your PC to the Mega 65 and sending them across. Uh, the, one, the method that we've been using so far um, is a serial connection. Uh, we use a, a, a JTAG adapter, a little device that plugs into the main board there. Um, I actually have mine routed with a little USB uh, extension cable, so it acts like a USB port for the Mega 65. That's not something that comes with it. That's something I added, but it's pretty cheap and easy to do. Uh, and then there are some tools that use that serial connection for development. So you can just sort of dump your program directly into the memory of the machine, or you can actually copy files onto the SD card without moving it back and forth. Um, some other cool stuff you can do with that. Pretty powerful. Um, in the next release of the firmware, you'll be able to use the Ethernet port for file transfer. I am Ooh. so excited yeah. for this. Um, uh, you uh, will not need additional hardware other than an Ethernet cable uh, to get that to work. So uh, they're, they're currently working on that. All of this lovely software that people have written 
uh, gets uploaded to uh, this website that we call the Mega 65 File Host. Uh, you can go there now and just see what's available. You can download all kinds of things. You can get the latest firmware, um, and the, the latest operating system software, all this stuff. It's also an excellent repository for information. People have been posting uh, um, a couple hundred articles now on doing different things with the Mega 65, um, uh, tracking projects and compatibility issues with Commodore 64 software, stuff like that um, is, is all in there. Uh, there's a wiki also. It's a little bit tricky to call it a wiki because we don't have it open for public editing. Uh, if anyone in this one room wants to edit the Mega 65 wiki, just ask. Uh, we are only uh, restricting it um, uh, to keep spammers off the thing. So it's really just, okay, ask for permission, you get an account, and then you can uh, do the wiki all you want. Um, some great articles in here, whether it's in Filehost or in wiki, is a question we haven't answered properly yet. Um, I usually put it in the wiki if I need, expect that other people will need to edit it later. That's all I've been doing. Um, uh, but there's some good information there, too. The main meeting spot for the Mega 65 community is the Discord. Um, there are some people that don't like Discord that would uh, beg to differ, but it is the, the main meeting spot. Um, it's a, a, a pretty active. You can reach almost anybody, uh, any of the major contributors to the project uh, pretty immediately, uh, time zones permitting. Um, I'm in there a lot, so if you want to find me, I can answer questions and things like that. Uh, there's also a pretty great... Uh, 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 Subforum of forum 64.de, which is a German uh, Commodore board that's pretty popular. Um, uh, I really like these guys. They mostly um, speak in German, so if you know German, that's <laughs> that's for you. Um, uh, but uh, there's a uh, they represent a contingent that has a heavy interest in basic programming, which is very um, uh, heartwarming for me. Like I, I really think it's uh, uh, useful and important that people connect with these machines uh, at, at every level. And so if they're just beginners, they just want to figure out how this thing works, um, uh, they do basic programming. So lots of basic, uh, basic coders um, in, in the forum. Um, so how are we doing on time? I, that, that, this is what I expected. So I have another minutes or so of material, um, and which is why I took up two slots on the board there. Um, this might be a, a good place to pause for questions. Um, I, you know, I'll take more questions at the end, but does anybody have any questions on what we've discussed so far? Yes. Yeah. So the keyboard that you threw up, that he held up, so there's like slots on it on the picture, but there wasn't the one he held up. Do you know what he held up? Is it like a black one? Um, the, the Commodore 16 or the... Yeah, so there's like slots on the, in the picture, but there wasn't in... Oh, the picture no, was for the. the uh, yeah. Do you mean like a, a connection slots for peripherals in the back? Do you mean like on the, the back of it? There's like. Uh, do you mean like on a C64? There's a user port and a cassette port and. Uh, <laughs> but not, okay. no, on the back of it. This is a Commodore 16. Yeah. You mean just like the. Um, the shape of the case. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, they're not really functional. They're more decorative or, or, or whatever, if that's what you mean. I love to be decorative. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, we, we, we did try to replicate the original design of the case. It was a very, uh, it was a Commodore motif of designing cases is that they had these sort of lines and stuff, if that's, if that's what you mean. You did all the design. Well, I know. I, I did. But yeah, it's, uh, uh, yeah, no, somebody else did, did that part, but uh, yeah. Um, okay, um, uh, I, I think I will plow ahead with uh, the, the rest of the material, if this is still interesting to people. If you, if you don't mind listening to me for 90 minutes. Mm -hmm. The CPU and the big, the big four, are they implemented in FPGA? Yes. Is there any appetite for having like big 20 compatibility for the frame? So, um, uh, I will talk about that in the next section right. for sure. Um, for you. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'll, I'll say the answer is yes. <laughs> Um, and uh, we'll, we'll get to that part. Um, yeah, F FPGA is, uh, opens up a lot of possibilities. Right. You talked about the Solonier kind of experience with, with things. Uh, are you hearing a lot of that about the city? Yes. Anyway, yeah, I'm sure. okay. uh, yes. Yes, yes, um, and, and, and in fact, it, with good reason in this case, we actually are currently unhappy with the SID implementation that we're using. Um, uh, so uh, there are just known issues uh, with the, the SIDs, but the, we'll upgrade them and figure that out. It's an active project to, to improve SIDs, uh, the SID quality. Okay. So everything we've talked about so far. Um, 
could be considered what, what I call the Mega 65 platform. It's everything that goes into recreating the Commodore 65 part of the experience. The platform can be described in, uh, as a couple of different th things. Um, and in fact, I, I would say it's layered. The bottommost layer is the physical hardware. It's the thing you buy, it's the plastic case, it's the FPGA, it's the keyboard, the ports, and all this other stuff. Um, uh, there's actually multiple versions of the physical hardware. There are uh, uh, the dev kits I've already mentioned are kind of a different physical hardware for the Mega 65. You can actually install the Mega 65 ecosystem onto an FPGA trainer board. Uh, which is how they used to develop it in the first place, and kind of cobble together a Mega 65 on top of the trainer board. You add your own keyboard and other things. Um, on top of that is the uh, FPGA core for the Mega 65. This is the chipset. This is the CPU, uh, the uh, VIC-4, the SIDS, and, and all that other stuff. Um, that, that gets installed in the FPGA uh, and represents the, the chips, basically, uh, the hardware architecture of the machine. On top of that is that meta operating system that I mentioned, which is called the hypervisor. It manages the startup of the machine, sort of figures out, okay, what am I running? Where is everything coming from? I'm putting together a Mega 65 for you. Uh, it includes uh, utilities that we saw, the freezer. It also has like a configuration utility for configuring uh, some of the hardware features. It has an SD card manager in it, so you need to format a new SD card for use. Uh, you use that, and some other low-level functions are, are managed by the hypervisor. Then there's the Mega 65 ROM, which I haven't fully defined yet, but I sort of described it as the operating system of the machine. It's the uh, basic ready prompt. It's the kernel. We talked about you know, the kernel and the Commodore 64, things like that. Uh, the uh, disk operating system code that, that you need to access. Uh, this is, uh, we call it the ROM because uh, this is what Commodore would have put on a single ROM chip in the original hardware. Uh, it's, uh, com it's Commodore code, right? It's the code that Commodore wrote that was going to power the machine. It's distinct in this case from the hypervisor. The Commodore 65 did not have a hypervisor. It was just going to run the ROM and that was it. Uh, but we had to manage these other additional modern features with a, an extra layer. Uh, so we call it the ROM. It's actually some data that lives on the SD card. Uh, it's just a kind of blob of data. And it loads it every time uh, from the SD card every time you start up your machine. So you can replace it with different ROMs or upgrade the ROM uh, just by copying a file to your SD card. And then on top of that is where the Mega 65 software runs. So if you've got your Showdown, your Hibernated One, your whatever, uh, will run on top of that. It uses the ROM operating system to interact with the machine, and in the, all these layers interact in that way. All of these layers are in active development, I should say. Uh, but even though it looks like it's a finished machine and we're used to these being finished machines, uh, uh, th these are all under active development, and they're all upgradable is the really fun part. Um, so uh, the Mega 65 platform, you would say, is the Mega 65. If you if you have a Mega 65, if you're writing software for the Mega 65, you're actually writing it for that whole stack, uh, for the most part. It's the Mega 65 experience. This experience and these layers are managed by the Mega 65 steering committee, uh, which is a group of people. Once we realized that just sort of being a free for all open source project was not in the best interest of the community, we realized, okay, we should have a, a, a core group of people that can make some tough decisions about what features go in, what features are left out. Out, uh, backwards compatibility, things like that. In fact, the, the steering committee's kind of primary mission is to maintain backwards compatibility. Now that people have these things and are writing software for them, we don't want that software to break, even if we continue to evolve the platform, um, adding features and fixing bugs. There are still lots of bugs to fix, so we want to make sure we are still actively developing these things, but that means engaging with a community of developers. And that means testing, also, which is something lots of hobbyist developers don't like doing. Um, it's very expensive and boring. Uh, but it's very important for ensuring backwards compatibility with software. We do a, a roughly twice a year release cadence for the whole stack. Uh, we do a, a kind of a release package that includes the new FPGA core and the new ROM and, the, and some system software. Um, uh, we, so far, it's been kind of rough as a schedule because we just coincide them with delivery batches. We like take everything that everyone's contributed so far and test them and pr prepare them as a release candidate for the next delivery batch. Uh, so the, the next batch is going to have this new version as its factory installed operating system and then everyone else who previously received the Mega 65 can just upgrade to the latest release. Uh, open source wherever possible, contributors welcome, I sort of mentioned that part. 
Uh, the closed ROM source is available to all owners. That license we got is, uh, applies to everyone who owns Omega 65. So if you just want to see what it looks like and you own Omega 65, uh, just ask and you can get access to the source code. Uh, contributors welcome on the ROM as well. Um, I'll say a little bit about the ROM specifically in part because it's kind of my what, what I've been managing lately. Uh, we do uh, fixes and feature completions uh, based on the Commodore 65 ROM. We also do some extensions, as I mentioned, um, um, uh, mostly just so far. We don't have a lot of new features planned or anything like that, uh, uh, but that's still kind of uh, uh, in, in the realm of what we're doing. Uh, some of the features that we added included uh, easier custom characters. If you want to customize the typeface or change the letters into little arcade graphics or something like that, that's really easy to do from basic now. Um, the music and sound features, if you've ever used the uh, Commodore 128 play command, which is, plays like some music, right? You say play these notes and, and it'll play some music. On the Commodore 128, uh, your program stops and, and plays the music and then continues. Uh, which is fine if all you want to do for your program is for everything to freeze and play a little music <laughs> and continue. Um, but uh, we changed it uh, a little bit, so now it plays asynchronously, which means it can be background music for an arcade game, which means your basic program can have like really easy um, background music and sound uh, that is just sort of automatically mixed and stopped and started automatically and things like that, and have arcade action managed by your basic program at the same time. We've added, I uh, mentioned, uh, we added some features to the DMA. You can access those features from BASIC um, uh, uh, with the, the ROM enhancements. Um, you, you might have seen, I, I don't know if I actually showed it properly, but you can use DOS wedge style commands uh, to load programs from a directory listing. So you cursor up and hit slash and return, and then it just loads the program, that kind of thing. Uh, that's built into the, to, to the operating system. Uh, fast variables. Uh, uh, undo home is one I'm particularly proud of because it was my first contribution. <laughs> um, uh, um, I am. Uh, you probably know a lot of these uh, Commodores have a delete key right next to the home key. And I am constantly accidentally hitting the home key when I mean to hit the delete key. And when that happens, it is just so disappointing on a Commodore <laughs> computer because my cursor is now in the upper left-hand corner of the screen. And on most Commodores, okay, I have to like sigh and then use the cursor keys to move my cursor back to where I was where I was trying to delete something. Um, on Omega 65, you can now just press escape home and it uh, moves your cursor back to where it was. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> there, there's also an 80 by 50 text mode that was added. It's a really fun way to add, uh, get a whole lot of uh, text on your screen if you want to get like a really long basic program listing. Yes? What are fast variables? Oh, yeah, I skipped that one, didn't yeah, I? Did. Um, uh, uh, in general, on Commodore Basics, when you uh, use a variable, it allocates some space for it and, and in, a, in a table somewhere. Um, in Basic 65, uh, variables with a single letter variable name are pre-allocated. Um, so it just saves some time. If, you, if you're just using a variable called S or something like that, it's already in memory. There's a fixed memory location for it and just uses it. Um, so they're, they're faster to access. They're faster to update um, than, than other variables. So it, it, your basic program would run faster using those? Yep, a little bit. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's tricky, too, because at 40 megahertz, you might not notice. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, in, in, in theory, it's, it, it's a little faster. Um, I feel like we're shifting the focus more towards bug fixes and fewer new features. It's just kind of a natural progression for the platform. Um, like I said, I don't want to rule out new features if there's something compelling or something important that somebody wants to add later. Uh, but for the most part, uh, the focus is on bug fixes. Uh, ROM development is very challenging. Um, it's all assembly language code. It is vintage assembly language code. Um, and uh, it's really packed in there. Like, uh, assembly language is one instruction per memory location. And so uh, when you have like a full ROM, like there's not very much space. Of 120K of ROM, there's maybe like a few K left uh, where we can actually add more code. But you can't just add code to the end. You have to, if you want to like, fix something that's in the middle, you have to like move everything over and move some things around and it's really challenging. It's not like modern software development where, you, where everybody's working on separate modules at different times and they can merge their code with a Git PR and all this other stuff. Um, it is much harder than that. Um, so you, we have to deal with limited code space. Um, it is much more difficult to collaborate on the ROM. Uh, historically, the, our ROM updates have always been responsibility of one person at a time because of this requires very specialized skills to understand all this uh, assembly language code and move it around. Um, so uh, one of the role things that the steering committee can do is triage bug reports. If 
feature requests. Like, we only have 3K left, what do we use it for? Uh, well, we've got some bugs that we want to fix. There are some new feature ideas that are cool ideas but might be expensive. Uh, if there's a, a bug that's a low priority, it takes up a lot of code space, and, a, and there's a bug that's a high priority, it takes a small amount of code space, we're going to have to prioritize the other one. Uh, the really tricky part for me is that there are bugs we haven't discovered yet. So, like, how do you prioritize unknown bugs? Um, and I feel like we've been sort of holding back on adding new features just so that we've got some, a little bit of spare space left uh, for the bugs that we haven't discovered yet. Um, and I mentioned the high bar for testing and backwards compatibility, which is really tricky. Um, this is a little technical, but I, uh, it's something I care about. And it, it has to do with the history of the Commodore 64 um, versus the Commodore 65 and what it means to evolve a new platform. Um, uh, the, the API surface, I, I'm using this term up here. Uh, API uh, stands for Application Programming Interface. It's a very common software engineering idea where you have some code that talks to other code, right? Um, that, that other code says, okay, this is what I support. These are the things you can do with me, um, uh, and this is how I work. And, an API is a promise that um, um, a, a platform makes to programs. It says that, okay, if you always uh, use these particular levers and knobs in the way that I described, it will always do that thing that you want it to do. Um, and it will not change. Even if it, you uh, have a new ROM that has bug fixes and all this other stuff, those levers and knobs will always do the same thing. Um, it's a promise to the developer that they can write a program that manipulates those levers and, ROMs, uh, lever, levers and knobs. Um, th that contract goes both ways, though, because it, it, it asks the developer to say, only use these levers and knobs. Don't touch anything else. If you, if you pry open the case and start poking around in the internals, you're going to write a program that doesn't work in a future version. Like, I'm allowed, as the platform developer, to change the inside of this thing. You're not allowed to see inside it. Um, and it's, it's a promise to do that. This is really hard on a Commodore because uh, uh, everyone can see everything on a Commodore. All of the ROM code is sitting right there in memory that anyone, any program can read, any developer can read it. Um, and so they have to kind of be disciplined and say, yes, I will only use uh, this thing. Uh, so an API surface might be the basic language, right? The basic language has a bunch of commands. They all say they do a specific thing. I might make a bug fix to the way one of those commands works, but it won't change uh, the behavior, the intended behavior of the command, right? Uh, assembly language can use like a kernel jump table, IO register locations. These would all be like published and ma made consistent across versions of the ROM. Um, so the Commodore 64, um, had a ROM, ROM code, the, the operating system was implemented on a ROM chip. Um, uh, ROM stands for read-only memory. It does not change. Um, and everybody basically just bought one, and most people had the same one. I understand that there are a couple of versions of the Commodore 64 ROM over time that had some minor changes between them. Uh, but for the most part, that ROM chip was ubiquitous, ubiquitously manufactured and, and rarely revised. And so all of those bytes, all of those internals, were mostly the same for every single Commodore. And eventually, developers decided that they could just ignore the contract, um, that, that all the stuff that's in that ROM is going to be there for everybody for the most part. So I can go ahead and start poking around in those internals, because I know they're not going to change. Um, uh, this is uh, tricky, like it, at least in theory it would tie Commodore's hands. If there were lots of major software developers that start doing the things they're not supposed to by poking around in the internals, um, then Commodore is in a bad spot. They can't change the internals without breaking all that software. And so like professional software, games or whatever that takes advantage of this other thing, uh, Commodore just can't change anything. No bug fixes, no new features, nothing. Um, they just have to leave it the way it is. The entire ROM becomes the contract, every single byte uh, in the ROM. Uh, this is actually really fun for developers. Like, developers have this machine, they say, okay, well, I'll just sort of mess around inside the code and I'll sort of hack on it until it works. And once it works on my machine, I know it works on every machine. Um, so that's a really fun way of doing it. They don't even have to read any documentation. They can just kind of get it to work. But this is terrible for platform maintainers because mm -hmm. uh, the platform maintainers can't change anything without breaking things. So that contract is really important. Um, so the Mega 65 is in this special spot where we are actually still trying to evolve the platform. We are trying to fix bugs and do sort of professional software engineering around uh, uh, these documented behaviors, which means we really need the community to not depend on undocumented behaviors. Uh, but all these people that are participating in Mega 65 development grew up with Commodore 64 development. And uh, as we all know, Commodore 64 development continued past the death of Commodore. 
So nobody was changing the ROM, which meant everybody could depend on the ROM staying the same, which meant that everybody has developed coding practices that rely on things being in the same spaces. Um, I don't mean to pick on mapping the Commodore 64, but I do sort of consider this as an example of like, was that the published API surface of the Commodore 64, or is that just some things that people found in the machine that seemed to be consistent across things? It was like a really detailed book. Everybody loves uh, this book particularly as being like the Bible for what's inside a Commodore 64. Um, but I don't think that we're ready for a mapping the Mega 65 book yet. Uh, because we're still messing with things, and we're still figuring out, okay, what can we promise? What can we make part of the API surface? Um, uh, so I, this is the main reason I'm involved in both the ROM and the manuals at the same time. I consider them the same project. Uh, we're trying to figure out, okay, what in the ROM is settled? Um, are these uh, things always going to be where we say they are? If so, let's write it in the manual and never change it. We can make that promise that these things are not moving. Um, so, it's a bit of a tricky task right now. I think it is going to settle over the next year or so. Um, we'll have more published API surface and so forth. Um, there's a kind of an open question, though, about whether we stop evolving the ROM, right? I mean, some people have suggested that, uh, that maybe those ROM should be like a Commodore 64 ROM and never change. Um, in my mind, there are just too many bugs. <laughs> uh, we have too much work to do still to make that decision. So um, yeah, someday, maybe, but not yet. So this is the Mega 65 platform, and it's layered. And we get a lot of advantages from the layering of the Mega 65 platform. Um, uh, for, for instance, that ROM I mentioned is just a file on the SD card. You can get rid of it. You can just delete it and put something else there. One of the fun things you can put there is the original Commodore 65 prototype ROM. That's still available. And it runs on Mega 65 hardware. In fact, we consider it appropriate <coughs> that, that we continue to support the original prototype ROM. Even though it's buggy and weird and all this other stuff, it has historical value. And you can use your Mega 65 to explore the history of this thing by going back to this early version of the ROM. Of course, the Commodore 64, uh, I'm sorry, Commodore 65 prototype ROM can only run Commodore 65 software. Uh, you might end up uh, with a program that runs on the Mega 65, but not on the Commodore 65. That's inevitable. Um, thankfully, there's not a lot of Commodore 65 software <laughs> written, so it's uh, not that big a deal. But there are a couple of like demos and things that were written at the time to exercise the thing. We consider it a little bit valuable that we, we maintain some compatibility with that software. Uh, but um, more to Graham's point. <laughs> Um, one of the things you can do is uh, uh, take away all the layers and go all the way down to the physical hardware. The FPGA means you can install a completely different core, a completely different set of chips you can put in your Mega 65 just by downloading those chips off the internet. So you can put in a Commodore 64 core. And now your Mega 65 is a Commodore 64. And it's not the weird Commodore 64 mode that uses the wrong CPU and is incompatible with the software. This can be the actual Commodore 64 with it, all the undocumented behaviors and complete compatibility with Commodore 64 software. Um, so you can run all Commodore 64 software on it. This exists. This is something you can do right now. There's a very good Commodore 64 core for the Mega 65 uh, by uh, M. Jurgen and Psy2002. Um, they're geniuses. They've been very productive in the last year. Um, and they've made this really well documented and very thorough uh, implementation on the Commodore 64 for the Mega 65. Uh, this is actually um, a port of the Mr. Core, if you're familiar with the Mr. platform for FPGAs. Uh, Mr. tries to have a course for all kinds of different machines you can run on a single hardware platform. Uh, Mega 65 is not quite compatible, but there, there is some adap adaptation you can do uh, uh, to get a Mr. Core. Um, you can port a Mr. Core to the Mega 65, so that's what they do here. Uh, it's a great core. It supports the SD card. You can put CRT files, D64 files on the SD card. Uh, it supports physical cartridges, IEC drives and devices, a very high uh, level of compatibility. Um, supports even the weirder cartridges like Easy Flash, uh, both versions 1 and 3. It supports fast loaders, Jiffy DOS, all kinds of stuff. It works. Um, they've implemented two SIDs. It's a dual SID uh, Commodore 64, and uh, they, it's got a built-in uh, RAM expansion. So it's got REU emulation for the uh, uh, programs that can do that. Um, some uh, various uh, video output modes and stuff, and it's really useful. I really love this because it's, it's, a, it's a hallmark of one of the main things that I think is really useful for the Mega 65 to be is a multi-core platform for Commodore computers, um, especially 
for the layout of the keyboard. <laughs> Uh, if you've ever used like the Vice emulator or anything like that, you're always messing with like a PC keyboard and trying to figure out, well, what does this actually translate to from Commodore 64? This is a Commodore keyboard layout. And so if this can be a multi-core Commodore, it can be a VIC-20, it can be a Commodore 64, a Plus 4, a C16, uh, a 128, a, a Commodore 65, a Mega 65, right? Um, we just need somebody to implement those cores. Uh, um, so it, like. We're making it easier. Hopefully, it'll happen someday. But this is like a huge step forward to have such a complete uh, and obvious uh, Commodore 64 core. Um, this is an essential upgrade. Oh, yeah. Question: how, how do you swap uh, the microcode in the FPGA? Oh, I'll show you. Huh? Um, uh, yeah. Um, I'll point out that the, uh, uh, the guys who made the uh, C64 core they generalized their work into a framework for porting Mr. Cores. Uh, so you can go out and find this and set it up. There's actually already a Game Boy Core and a ZX Spectrum Core that can run on the Mega 65. And that is Galaga wow. for the Mega 65. That is not an emulation, that is not a port, that is the actual arcade board implemented as a core. Hmm. Um, for some definition of actual, of course, but you know what I mean. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is Galaga running on a Mega 65. That's a work in progress. Uh, so yeah, so this is the, the screen where you can actually um, swap the, the cores. I can also do a live demo if you want to see it. Um, uh, this is, you just turn off the machine, hold down the no scroll key and turn it back on and then let go and it gets into this menu. Um, there are eight slots. Um, uh, slot zero is reserved for the factory installed core, but we're actually adding the ability to upgrade that as well. Um, and you can um, uh, copy the core data onto the SD card and then flash it into one of these slots. Uh, I've been doing a lot of testing of uh, uh, new versions of the core, uh, so that's why the word unsafe appears on the screen <laughs> a few times. Uh, but I've got the Commodore 64 core in here as well. Um, we're, we're working on a feature um, in the next firmware uh, where this uh, core selection process uh, can use a different core depending on what kind of cartridge you have plugged in. So if you have a Commodore 64 cartridge plugged in, it'll automatically select the Commodore 64 core. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Um, so um, can you even do like, um, console like um, for example like NES and Sega Genesis like stuff on there like anything from the time yes huh? yeah yeah um, uh, as to like what fits in the FPGA I don't have a really good answer because I don't fully understand it um, uh, but I, I think most cores that are available for the mister will work on the mega 65 and they've already got uh, SNES and, and NES and Sega Genesis and, and a bunch of those yeah and it would be like really com highly compatible uh, a, a version of that hardware. Uh, yeah. So, um, so I, I went through this. So this was a lot of technical detail. Um, I'm sorry if it was a little bit boring, um, but it's exciting to me. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, but I wanted to go through this sort of layered architecture a little bit because I want to answer this question: Who is the Mega 65 for? Uh, a, a very common reaction I've seen to the Mega 65 is it does so much. Like it, it, it can do. It's like what's it's a it's a FPGA machine, it's a Commodore 64 that's not very good, or it's a very good Commodore 64 in another way, or it's a, a Commodore 65, or it's a Mega 65, like, there's so much here, who is, is going to use this? And I think the answer is in the layered architecture, it means that you can engage with this program at multiple levels. Um, and so if you just want, like, a, a, a simple machine, you can use that um, uh, um, as, as a simple machine. Uh, if you want to get deep into the weeds, you can definitely do that. And that's what these layers allow you to do. Um, so I think it's for recreational computing. Uh, I, I think it's for casual engagement of ideas of computers, um, just like they were back in the day, right? Um, like almost anyone can pick up a Commodore 64 and just try writing a small program. Um, even if it, and it, it's not very substantial, it doesn't do very much, it, it's just a benefit that, that you can uh, uh, engage with it, just programming a basic program. And you can enjoy the products of other Mega 65 developers. That's a very common thing to do. You get one of these and with the intent of like, okay, I'm going to sit here and wait until somebody makes a really cool game for it and then I can play it on my Mega 65. I, I think that's valid. Um, so Commodore enthusiasts, uh, especially now with the Commodore 64 core, um, I think is a, is a really strong demonstration that uh, this is a great Commodore collector or Commodore enthusiast computer uh, because it can be kind of a modern version of uh, a whole bunch of different Commodores and uh, allow you to explore Commodore history, engage with uh, Commodore uh, uh, communities and development. Uh, for real software uh, engineering or software development, 
Um, it's really fun. Uh, as I mentioned, you can sort of see that I'm like really excited about the architecture of the thing, uh, the low-level hardware and all the extra features that have been built in. It's really fun to go spelunking in this stuff <laughs> and just kind of figure out what does it do, how does it work, um, how do this, all these graphics modes work and what does that mean and stuff. And you can write some serious software for yourself or for other people. Um, but even software development can happen at multiple layers, right? Like you've got basic programming, you can sort of live in basic and have a really good time. Um, or you can go super deep into a program that takes over the whole machine with machine code. Or you can even write a program that completely deletes the ROM off the thing and just says, okay, I don't need any of that ROM nonsense. I want direct access to the hardware. I'm going to make this really kick-ass arcade game and I'm just going to ignore all the ROM code. Um, so and then you can also just sort of make your own computers. <laughs> you, can, you can get into core development and um, uh, design chipsets for the FPGA. Uh, I think it's going to be more common for people to port Mr. Cores than actually write ones from scratch. Um, but I kind of am excited about writing one from scratch. That sounds super fun to me. Um, to, to write some you know, Verilog or VHDL code that designs a CPU and all this other stuff that we did back in college. Like it's, uh, it could be really fun. Um, and, and there's a fun way to do that. And then the actual physical hardware, like people build entire new computers. I mentioned that FPGA trainer board that runs the, the, some of this stuff. Uh, people have cobbled together uh, computers to do that and even made accessories for the thing. Yeah? So you could basically make like your own computer with the Mega 65. Yeah. That's really insane. Yeah, it is. Um, uh, yeah, and um, I think some people might quibble over the definition of a computer when it comes to an FPGA. Uh, it's, it's tricky. Like, you really have to get to the point where you know that the FPGA is actually implementing a computer electronically. Um, it is actual electrical signals going into and out of the chip that are behaving as a custom chip that you designed. And so when you come up with a new computer that you want to build, uh, you describe it as if it were electronics and then upload those electronics. It's, I'm using scare quotes because it's kind of weird to say that's what you're doing, but it's it basically the same as using actual chips that you've designed in a, a chip making manufacturer or something like that. Um, so who is this for? Question, are, are yeah. some of these cores available on GitHub, like things you can download, compile yourself with, you know, what, what tools are available to compile them into, into Yes, code, um, code? I haven't done a core compilation myself yet. Um, I believe a lot of this is based on the Xilinx toolchain, which you can get for free. It's a commercial product. It's very large. It takes a long time to download and install. Um, uh, but yeah, there and I, there might be some open source tools that do something similar. I have not uh, fully explored that yet. But um, yeah, the course themselves, a lot, all, all of these are on GitHub, uh, including the Make 65 core. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so so who is this for? It's for Lucy Morton. Uh, I, I think I think Lucy Morton would have really enjoyed a Mega 65. Lucy Morton was a, a member of the Diablo Valley user group that was featured in that episode of the Computer Chronicles mm. uh, back in 1988. She and her, hus her husband uh, wrote Commodore 64 software for charting sweater patterns. Mm -hmm. She makes sweaters. And uh, there's a lot of math involved in designing sweaters. And so she used uh, the Commodore 64 uh, to write a program. You sort of describe the specifications of your sweater and the features you want it to have. And then it comes up with uh, the pattern you can sort of print out and, and they're like instructions for knitting together your sweater. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I haven't had time to verify this independently, but I found someone on Twitter who claims that Lucy's program was distributed uh, oh, wow. by a software company, uh, the, the Cochineal Computer Knit Products Company. Uh, that company still exists today. They're still in business, <laughs> and they're still selling sweater software, and it's amazing. Um, uh, I don't know if they're selling Lucy's product anymore, but uh, it, I just love that connection. still has kind of a modern thing. Um, so, uh, yeah, Commodores, and I like a lot of microcomputers, but I think Commodore gets a lot of credit for this, are designed such that programming is just another way of using the computer. Um, it's a way that everybody used computers at, at the time. If they needed it to do something, they wrote a program to make it do that. Um, and I truly believe there's something for everyone in the task of programming. Um, and, it, you know, I know modern computers are very complicated and, and, and hard to program. That's definitely true. Um, uh, uh, but that's why we one reason why I think we can use uh, these uh, older computers with simpler designs um, and have a more intimate connection with our computers. The Mega 65 sells for 666 euros. Um, 
Uh, shipping to the United States is a little pricey, so this turns out to be about eight hundred dollars U.S. If you want to get it here, it's like a hundred bucks or something. Eight hundred thirty-one dollars. Yeah, one hundred thirty-one dollars <laughs> in shipping. Um, uh, if you pre-order now, you'll get it in 2024. And as I mentioned, you can use the emulator in the meantime. Just go to mega65.org and click on the little circle in the corner that says pre-order. Uh, you can find me at dansanderson.com, and please subscribe to my newsletter at m65digest.substack.com. Uh, I'll be happy to answer any and all questions you have. Thank you very much. Alice has a question. Yeah. Um, so what's funny to me is that um, the Apple One, it had the same price, but in dollars, not in pounds. Yeah. 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 I, I, I think that's a little intentional. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Is there GPIO access? If you want to do like hardware hacking, um, connect up a robot or something to it. There is something on the main board that I haven't played with. Um, I know there are like PMOD ports or something. Uh -huh. yeah. um, uh, it's not a full rack of GPIO like a Raspberry Pi, but I think it's pretty similar. You might know more about it than I do, actually. Um, uh, I, I've not really uh, torn it open yet. Um, I, I was telling somebody a story uh, 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 earlier today that. Uh, the uh, first set of Mega 65s, they have a built-in real-time clock, uh, but about 20% uh, about of the time, it doesn't work. Yeah. Uh, on like 20% of machines, yeah. it, it, the, the, the clock was bad. And uh, we uh, had to come up with some kind of workaround. And so we used one of those expansion ports that's on the main board to say, okay, well, let's write some uh, code in the core that uh, it detects if a different real-time clock was plugged into one of those expansion ports. And then it just uses the new one instead of the one built onto the board. And so anyone with a broken real-time clock could get a, you know, put together a little thing that plugs into one of those expansion ports hmm. um, and then just becomes the new real-time clock for the machine. Um, uh, I, was, I was frustrated with the fact that 20% uh, of uh, units were affected and there was no way to like get like it was just too high a bar to say, okay, go out and buy some electronics parts and a soldering iron and I put these things together and then plug them in the board. And so I bought 50 of them and assembled them myself and put them in little boxes. And if anybody has a broken Mega 65 and wants a replacement real time clock, let me know. I'll give you one. Thanks. Um, I, I, I have a little program, I have a little Google form you can fill out with your address and I'll just send them out uh, whenever anybody needs them. So. Cool. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, Tommy, go you first. Uh, uh, we always talk about it. Um, I don't know. I really don't know. I, I, uh, I've, I've watched my kids grow up with sort of newer versions of this idea. Like the Arduino is kind of a, a meant to be a modern version of a simple computer you can learn to program. I think there's a lot of um, uh, uh, potential in that idea that might actually be better than throwing people at, at old computers. Um, I think Raspberry Pis are great, um, but at a different level. Um, that kind of thing. Uh, I think about it all the time. I like, what would like a modern version of this? Like, you, you use those rose tinted glasses on the nostalgia that we have for our old computers, and invent an all new experience that's just that modern experience. Um, uh, I'm a, a big proponent of uh, Pico 8, which is a, a retro fantasy uh, a console that doesn't have hardware. It's actually a program that runs on a modern computer, um, and it's meant to be a little programmable computer. Um, that you that it behind the scenes uses the fact that you've got a powerful computer doing it to make it easier to program. So it kind of looks like a retro machine, but it programs as we remember these machines being easy to program. Um, not how they actually are. Like, <laughs> we've, we've all got actual machines set up here, and we all know that they're a little bit clunky and uh, can be difficult to engage with because of some you know, realities of old-fashioned computers. And Pico 8 is just Lua. It's just a, the Lua programming language in a little tiny window, and it's got some really easy graphics APIs and things like that. Um, I think that kind of abstraction um, is a really interesting way to sort of couch uh, the, um, hide away the complexity and still expose um, a really useful set of having an intimate, productive relationship with a, a program platform. Um, so yeah, I, I do think it's possible to make real hardware that works like that, but um, it's, it's tricky. Uh, the Mega 65, I think, sort of trips a little bit in that regard because it's a, a fealty to history. Um, uh, like, it, it's it, the the Commodore 65 warts and all in a certain extent. It's still the Commodore line editor, which I love. I have lots of respect for the the screen editor that the, the, the Commodore invented, but it's old fashioned um, in, in many ways. Um, and I don't know if young kids, you know, super. I mean, we can ask some <laughs> how happy they are uh, with it. But uh, yeah. 
Um, uh, one thing we have talked about is making a new version of the Mega 65 that's reduced cost and doesn't have the floppy drive. Um, that's just an idea that gets floated around. We don't have real plans for that yet, um, but that would be the education model, I think. It would just be like, okay, this is something we can distribute um, and, and sell to classrooms and stuff. Yes? Speaking of that, Dan, uh, there was supposed to be a, uh, how can I put it, a handheld version, a portable version of the Mega 65? Yes. You know, what, is, what are the plans for that? Um, uh, it is still in the uh, prototype stage, and uh, um, I'm very excited about it. Um, I, uh, uh, this talk was already so long that I deleted the 10 slides I had on that project. <laughs> okay. um, uh, uh, but very briefly, uh, uh, we want to make a mobile phone, um, uh, an actual touchscreen mobile phone uh, based on the Mega 65 Ooh. that runs the Mega 65 core and ROM and software and has uh, some uh, phone apps <laughs> written in for the Mega 65. Um, uh, it, it sounds ridiculous, but the, the basis for the project is uh, very sound and important. It's uh, based on the idea that um, we are alienated from ourselves when we have these really complex computers run by mega corporations and, and closed source projects and all this other stuff, controlling all of our data and every, every aspect of our lives. Um, and uh, uh, so, so the megaphone is an experiment uh, to see if the accessibility of this platform at every layer uh, can be valuable in a phone, phone form factor. Um, that it, what happens if your phone is a mega 65 and you can carry it around? Um, uh, I've seen photos of the early prototypes that are more like a Nintendo Switch than a phone, uh, but uh, uh, they're really cool looking and uh, there's uh, a grant uh, that's, uh, uh, for developing the software a little bit further uh, into kind of a workable um, uh, part. It's got a, a, a voice modem and stuff. If you look in the, the uh, details of the um, audio system of the Mega 65, um, there's like um, registers and parts of the audio system for like a microphone and, uh, and, and some of these other things. And, and that's a part of this uh, kind of simplified design intended to, to apply to the megaphone. Sir, there's another question here. I was just wondering if this presentation will be available online in video format or YouTube. Uh, yeah, YouTube. So, so the recording we're making now will be online. And tomorrow, tomorrow too, tomorrow's presentation. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, uh, I might do a, 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 a standalone read of this also, just on my own YouTube channel at some point, and I'll send that out, if, just because I put it together and I well have like a, a video version of this one. Anything else? Yeah. I've heard that there are some work on a BBS community too, um, mm -hmm. do you know much about that? Um, I'm, I'm not aware there's a lot of progress, it's certainly an idea that everyone likes to talk about, so <coughs> just got, we're waiting for somebody to do it. Um, uh, the uh, Ethernet port, uh, um, it doesn't need work. We've got actual working demos of accessing the Internet over the thing. Um, there's like a, the Wii IP stack I think we have working um, uh, in a certain respect. I know Paul was working on a sort of proprietary web browser uh, that uh, uh, allowed you, wow. uh, he had some ideas of like you can access a, a, an H65 file on a website somewhere and it actually loads uh, directly into screen memory or something like that. So you can have like full graphic uh, Mega 65 things. Like the hard part for the Mega 65 will be parsing an HTML document and doing layout <laughs> and stuff, right? So um, I think the idea there was that you pre-render it and put the pre-rendered web page on your website and then it just sort of draws it onto the screen as it loads it. Um, that, I mean, that's not BBS necessarily, but uh, uh, I think there's a, uh, some steps there as to like, okay, this, this could be for Telnet BBSing or this could be for uh, uh, any of these other things. I'm, I, I'm worried, like, I'm looking at these cameras and I'm worried that I'm missing somebody else's existing project, so I apologize to anybody that, whose project I do not mention. Uh, I'm, I don't know of everything uh, for the Mega 65, so there might be something in the works that I'm uh, not thinking of. But I think there is a terminal client. No, I think about it. You can talk about it in your talk tomorrow. <laughs> I'll look it up. I'll look it up and mention it tomorrow. <laughs> Cool. Um, I'm here both days. Come say hi and talk, ask more questions and play with my Mega 65. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dan. Thank you.